Welcome to Bethel Christian Assembly from Lakewood, Colorado. Thanks for joining us today. We hope this message blesses you. Let's join in now. So this morning we're going to have Mr. Austin come and explain all this stuff. He, I don't know. Oh my God. <laughs> He's, uh, looks like he's ready to go to work, brother. Time to get up and go. Uh, you out of quarantine? Sure does. Huh? Yes, sir. You got more. How long? What happens when you have to go to the restroom? Uh, you got a plan. Yeah, you got a plan ahead. Plan ahead. Okay, well, we're going to talk about planning ahead and, and just the, all the tools that you need. Amen? Amen to that. There you go. Good morning. Good morning. As I said before, I think I found your get up and go. Got up, left your house, came over to mine, and kept me up for four hours. <laughs> kept me up till 4 a.m. this morning. So, got a couple things we need to talk about this morning. First off, we're going to start off. Sounds really quiet in here. Can I get a good morning? Good morning. Yeah, try again. One more time. Good morning. Good morning. That's better. Okay, first things first. Got a lot of work to do. I hope you all are ready. Got a couple things to talk about. First off is our safety topic. We're going to be talking, talking about tools, proper use, how not to injure yourselves using them, or others for that matter. And uh, afterward, we're going to talk about the proper use of said tools. What situations would you need these tools in? As you can see, I've got quite a few tools on me and quite a few tools in the bag. So, let's talk about the JHA, Job Hazard Assessment. As I go to work every day, that is the number one first thing that we do every single day when we get on the job. We talk about what's going on today, what's gonna happen today, what kind of things are we doing? what hazards are going to exist. And yes, other people do count as a hazard. Yes, a very large hazard. Other trades, working around other people. And just like Gary said, if it wasn't for people, this job would be easy. <laughs> so, what hazards do I encounter all the time? Nearly getting caught on fire, slips, trips, falls, walking on six inch beams, three, four stories in the air. Absolutely, all sorts of hazards. But that's not where I'm at today. I'll tell you exactly where I'm at today. I'm right here. Amen. So let's change up that JHA a little bit and talk about the hazards of the ministry. Yes, believe it or not, there are hazards in the ministry. So, first things first. What's the biggest hazard that we come up against when we start talking about the Lord? First thing that comes to mind is, well, me. I'm my biggest obstacle. Wow. I'm my biggest obstacle, I'm my biggest hazard on the job when I'm talking about God, when I'm teaching others and helping others realize that, hey, there's a better life out there. There's a better choice that can be made. There's all sorts of good things, but you know what? Sometimes I stand in my own way and that message doesn't get through. So we're going to talk about how to avoid that. How, in fact, do I get around myself? And in doing so, to get around ourselves, we have tools. And I've got a lot of tools, believe you me. That thing weighs about 35 pounds. And this belt itself weighs about 20. And that's light. 
You should see me on the job. The thing gains about 40 pounds. <laughs> and I still got that same get up and go as usual. Oh, the way that harness looks, it seems like you should be talking higher. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But I tell you what, it's cinched up like this for a reason. Because if it's any looser, it's called incorrect PPE. You're wearing it incorrectly, and if I were to fall, this harness would not provide me the same protection, loose and comfortable, as it would be cinched up and tight like it needs to be. Check this out. Loose and comfortable versus cinched up and tight. If we're using our tools incorrectly, how effective are they going to be? Not very, I'll tell you that much. When I wear this harness, I have to fit two fingers in and out. That's just enough to keep the circulation from getting cut off. But in the event of a fall, it's tight enough to keep me from falling through my harness. And I tell you what, I get made fun of that all the time. Being so tiny, oh, you're going to fall through your harness just because no matter what. And I just tell them, you know what? So be it. I'm wearing it the right way. If I do everything right and something bad still happens, well, it's not my will, but his will be done. He's got a better prop. He's got a better place for me to go, a better job for me to do, and if that's the way he needs me to get out of one place and get to another, that's how it's going to be, and I'm perfectly A-OK -okay with that. So, moving on, I'm going to talk about a couple different tools that we have to get around ourselves. Let's turn to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 17. Technically, I'm starting at chapter 4, but chapter 317, it just starts everything off so nicely. And that says, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Amen. I tell you what, I think I'm equipped, ready to go each and every day. Wake up in the morning, put on my tools, and I'm ready to go, ready to take on any situation that my boss tells me that I got to do. Well, what kind of tools do I need to equip myself with or have the Lord equip me with to do his work? Because he's my boss. Amen. He's my boss, and he tells me exactly what I need to do each and every day. So what kind of tools do we have access to that we can use to do our jobs to the best of our ability. Beginning of chapter 4. I solemnly charge you before God and Christ Jesus who is going to judge the living and the dead. And because of his appearing and his kingdom. Just listen to that. What does that sound like? It sounds like some direct instructions. Paul's writing these letters to some fellow co-workers in similar unique situations in the ministry. And he's writing all of this to give them sincere and honest instruction on how their jobs need to be done according to the will of God. And I tell you what, that sounds an awful, like my for awful lot like my foreman telling me what my task is going to be for the day. And I tell you what, sometimes takes, oh, maybe 10 seconds. Walk on the job and says, hey, goggles, you know what you were doing yesterday? Yeah, what about it? Keep on going. Your job ain't done yet. It's a week and a half long project. Can do, Captain. See you at lunch. <laughs> So, verse 2, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, rebuke, correct, and encourage with great 
patience, and teaching. There's three tools right there. Three great tools. Rebuke, correct, encourage. Three great tools that we can use each and every day to do our jobs. And that's not counting the key ones that we find in Galatians 5.22. The fruit of the Spirit, peace, patience, joy, gentleness, and self-control. Not in the right order, but those are just a bunch of tools. And here is three more. Rebuke. How many times have you done something incorrect on the job and your boss decides to come up and give you a word or several about how you burned out the grinder, cutting off a bolt that did not need to be cut off? <laughs> or putting in a door three and a half inches above the threshold when that door wasn't even meant for that floor even. Yep, bunch of stern words there, but I tell you what, rebuke, we're not going to make that mistake again. Rebuke, correct. Now those two words are one and the same. Rebuke is just correcting with a little bit of oomph behind it. Because sometimes that little oomph is what some people need, I know I do, sometimes, to get the job done. Because God's got a job to do too. And he's got a lot more on his plate than I do, I believe you that much. Rebuke, correct. Now this is the last and most important tool on this particular list. Encourage. You can rebuke all you want. And especially on the job, I see a lot of businesses and a lot of bosses that sit there and beat down and beat down and beat down. They do it the incorrect way. And they don't back it up with encouragement. Because if you rebuke and correct, but don't encourage the correct behavior that you're encouraging or that you instill in that individual by rebuking them, it's not going to stick. It's like nailing together a house with a handful of nails as opposed to several hundred thousand. That house is going to fall apart. You're not using the right technique, the right tools for the job. Encourage with patience, as it says. Encourage with great patience and teaching. One thing I look up to, especially when I see a journeyman or I'm put up with a journeyman or I'm working with my boss himself, which happens every once in a while, it's quite fun. He knows a lot. Is when he sits there and he's like, hey, check it out. I see you're doing it this way. Try doing it this way. So I do it. Was that easier? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. When I do say yes, cool, that's a skill. That's another tool I can stick in my bag to use in the future. Just like God gives us tools, gives us lessons each and every day to teach us to use in the future to bring praise, honor, and glory to him. But sometimes, no matter what the tools were given, sometimes the situation just doesn't line up and it's not ready to be worked on. Verse 3 says, For the time will come, when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. Now tell me, how familiar does that sound today? Where do you see that today? 
You can't teach someone who doesn't want to learn. You can try. But that just brings one little phrase to mind, and that's something Pastor Gary says every once in a while. If you don't strike oil in 15 minutes, quit boring. <laughs> but even then, sometimes, if you don't strike oil in the first couple sentences, or you can look at the ground and see, hey, there's not even going to be any oil here. It's not ready yet. The pie is not done. The proverbial pie is still cooking. God has not prepared the soil of that individual as of yet. Not our will, but his will be done. So we wait with great patience and self-control. More often than not, I see individuals who are so eager to preach the message, to talk about God, that they end up shooting themselves in the foot and hardening the hearts of those they're trying to talk to. Because the soil's not ready. Rome wasn't built in a day. A hundred thousand acres of corn doesn't grow in a day. You don't plant a field like that in a day. So what do you do? You start somewhere. You pick a corner of that field and you plant the first seed. And then you plant the next one. And the next one. And the next one. And you keep going throughout the weeks and weeks and weeks of planting. And pretty soon, it's harvest time before you know it. And you get to reap the efforts of what you've sown. So it is with teaching. Some people take to it easier, more fertile ground. I did a little bit of research on that subject. Did you know certain types of ground will grow things four times as fast as others? Certain ground over in Hawaii, right at the foot of the volcano, covered in ash or at the foot of Mount St. Helens, it's flourishing. Volcanic ash is a great fertilizer. Has all those minerals and whatnot that get stirred in with the soil and mixed in with the rain and sunk down into the ground and it just creates this beautiful soil that just grows anything and everything that it just falls on it. And the Lord just gives it this little bit of rain and it sprouts up like nobody's business. Just as God intended. So we got to use self-control. There's another tool. Discern what time is right and what time is not right. But in doing so, let us not give up. Because if we give up, then what's the point? A farmer doesn't throw a seed and then go sit in his house for six months waiting for that seed. No, he goes out and he checks on it. Yep, looks like it's doing all right. Hmm. Could use some more rain. Might want to turn on the sprinklers. I don't see any rain in the forecast. It's a constant effort. Keeping an eye on them. How about this? Call your friends. Call your family. Check up on them. It's a good story. My mother is a chef of 21 years. Raised my sister and I by herself while trading off with my dad. They're divorced. 21 years she jo joined a job when I was in the third grade. Intending on it only being a job for, oh, six months while she looked at something, something later. 19 years later, I'm out of high school, year and a half through college, graduated college. She's still working at the same restaurant that she joined when I was in the third grade. Tell you what, yeah, that sure is a long six months. So, <laughs> a 
And all that time, she's hurt herself so many times, and it's just destroyed her body so much. She's in so much pain, and I prayed every day, every day, once I knew the directive and how to do it, and I started using the tools at my disposal, the word, my friends, family, to direct appropriate prayer to help my mother get something that wouldn't destroy her body each and every day. Then about four or five months ago, I get a phone call. Hey, guess what? I got a new job. I got a new job. And I was like, oh, really? What restaurant's going to destroy you now? I know it's not going to be Qdoba. You just left there. And it's not Applebee's. You left there. What is it now? And she just gave me 10 seconds of silence over the phone and said, you're going to love this. Turns out she threw an application out for a whole bunch of different restaurants. And uh, a couple weeks later, she gets a phone call. It ain't a restaurant. Turns out it's the daughter of a software megalomaniac, a pseudo multi-billionaire. They need a housekeeper. For their three mansions, we're talking 23 bedrooms, two kitchens, 17 bathrooms, and four living rooms, three times the size of this building. It takes her six days to clean one. But, long story short, she gets the job. And uh, she told her new boss, so this is only gonna be a second job. I need to go and find something else to, uh, to kind of supplement my income so we can afford to pay my, my uh, husband's medical bills and help keep us on our feet. The one thing my mom didn't tell me was they're a Christian family. Very, very in touch with God. Before my mom could finish her sentence, Lady held out her hand and went, stop. You don't need a second job. We're going to pay you enough in 40, week, or in 40 hours a week, full time, for both you and your husband to live comfortably. Amen. And you can take as much time off as you want that you need to. You can complete the business that you need to. And... Anything you could possibly need, we will provide for you. Let's say you're up here to catering to one of our family reunions. There's like 200 people there for those, and they last like three days. And the last one, I think they tried to get, oh, I don't remember, some big name. I know they've got skillet reserved for this year. I'm, I'm not joking there. I figured that out on the phone yesterday. So anyway, long story short, I told my mom, you know what this is? This is an answer to my prayers. God's knocking on the door, Mom. Like I've been telling you for Years and years and years, God's knocking. You've got to pick up the phone. And this is the perfect opportunity to do so. God's saying, hey, you've got tools. Who gave them to you? I just want you to say, hey, I know who gave me these blessings. So, in doing so, there's one thing that we need to keep in mind 
each and every single time we use these tools. Be mindful of the appropriate use of said tools. But there's two tools that we need to maintain focus on if anything else is going to work. Now notice I've taken everything else off. The only thing I still have on are my little tool pouch that never comes off. And my harness. This is the most important part of my entire getup. I can do without the vest. Maybe not the hard hat, but certain spots I can take it off. But in order to use these tools, and in order to go out on the job, certain spots are very, very dangerous and very, very hazardous to our livelihood when I'm on the job. And that is walking the iron, going out four stories above, walking on nothing more wide than the thickness of my boot. So what do we do? We tie off. We tie off and it keeps us, if we fall, it'll save our lives. What does that sound like? If we fall, our lives will be spared. So I tell you what, I tie off to my Lord and Savior Jesus. And he keeps me safe in that aspect that if I fall, my life will be spared. Sure, I may get beaten and bruised in the process, but I'm still alive. I can heal. So what do we do? We maintain tie-off to our Lord 100%. 100%. We don't take the lanyard off and jump it which we call rope jumping, it's quite frowned upon on the job, but it happens. No, that's why we have two lanyards, so we can move one and then unclip the other. We're not untied at all. I am not untied from my Lord at all. And there's two ways, just like this harness has multiple parts. I've got the harness itself, a lanyard, which my boss refused to let me bring in this morning. Um, because they, they're notoriously expensive. Um, and the anchor point itself. Three parts, but there's two parts that we need to pay attention to when we tie off to the Lord. First one is prayer. 100% constant prayer all the time, every day from sun up to sun down, from our first moment of consciousness in the morning to our last moment of consciousness at night when we fall asleep. Be in prayer. That's one way we maintain tie off to our Lord. And the second one is reading the word. This whole thing wouldn't have been if I didn't open up the word. I wouldn't have any of this paper or any of these tools on this morning. I'd be sitting in the front row listening to what Gary has to say, what the Holy Spirit has given Gary to say. But had I not opened the book, I wouldn't have been led to volunteer to be up here this morning. And that's proper use of our tools. And the last one, which rounds everything else up, and one thing that I see so many people, as well as myself sometimes, in using these tools, the most important thing to keep in mind is our attitude when using these tools. We need to be excited every day to go out and do the Lord's work. 
I love getting up in the morning sometimes to go to my job at the airport. You know, a lot of times I'll wake up, feel groggy, get in the truck, still feeling dumpy. I'll get maybe halfway up I-25, about five minutes away from I-70, and I'll start waking up, I'll start getting in the groove, and by the time I reach the parking lot at the airport, I'm ready, rooting, tooting, ready to go. Give me a hammer and something to bang on, and I'll be, you better believe I'll be there. I'm ready to go. Just like here. I've held on to this particular message for about three months now. I've had this. But I tell you what, I was ready at the drop of a hat. What's the song, Dan? The song's called Ready, Not Get Ready. There you go. <laughs> ready to go at the drop of a hat. The song's called Ready, Not Getting Ready. And we need to be ready to use whatever tools we have at our disposal every single day to preach the good word of God to our friends and family. So let's remember what's most important. Others, when we talk about and use our tools, joy, Jesus, others, ourselves. First, we got to tie off before we can even go on to the job site. That's Jesus. Others, we got to have our objective. What are we going to be working on? We're going to be working on others and ourselves. We need to maintain control of ourselves and our tools via self-control and proper attitude to utilize and complete the job to the best of our ability to give God the praise, honor, and glory. And all that from a simple passage in 2 Timothy. An instruction manual for proper tool usage, just like the OSHA manual is for proper safety. And I'm glad to see everyone's wearing their appropriate PPE this morning. That's the end of our toolbox talk this morning. Let's, uh, let's end it by going to prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this opportunity to be here this morning that you gave me the energy and to get up and go, to come up and speak this morning, to give you the mess, to give the message to the people that you wanted me to give this morning, Jesus. Just thank you for every single moment that you have prepared us for and every opportunity that you place in front of us. Because I know that if we maintain 100% tie off to you, Lord, we can get this job done like you wanted. And you still want. I pray for those who are not here this morning. I pray that you place your healing hand on them. and Keep them safe and sound. And let them know you are here, Lord. I also pray for those who are here. It's been a difficult week. As you may know all about it already. Things have happened that have not been entirely up to us, Lord, but we know it's your will, not ours. And I pray as we go forward this week that you keep everyone here as well as everyone outside this four walls safe and sound and under your hand that we may do your work, that we may be ready each and every day to do your work to bring others to the foot of the cross and help them get to know you, Lord. All these things and everything else today, yesterday, and tomorrow, for the rest of our days, I give you thanks. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Please let us know how we can pray for you and your loved ones. You can submit your prayer request at itswritten.org, as well as find additional teachings in truth. If you would like to join us in person, we meet Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. For more information, our address and phone number are on our website, itswritten.org. 
Thanks and God bless you.